Hello, and welcome to Young at Harp. Today, we're going to talk about the shadow. <laughs> I am Deborah Henson Conant, also known as Deborah, also known as DHC, and I'm here with Kathleen Wiley. I am a composer and performer, and Kathleen is a Jungian psychoanalyst, and we both play the harp. So this is called Young at Harp. Kathleen, I've been reading a book called The Tools, and they keep referring back to Jung. And one of the things that they talked about was the shadow. And I would love to know from you, what is the shadow? What does it do? Where does it fit in our lives? What, uh, you know, and how does it relate to our artistic creation or just our creative expression in life in general? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, shadow is one of those concepts of Jung's that's made it out into the collective and people use the word in many different ways. But what Jung himself meant by the collect by, by the um, shadow is that it's the personal unconscious. So that everything that we are not conscious of in our own personal psyche, our own personal expression, our own personal energy field is shadowed i.e. it's in the unconscious. It is unknown to us. Wow. So what I'm thinking about when you say shadow is a shadow is not there unless we are there. Like our shadow right. can't be there without us. So it is a, an indication that we are there, that mm -hmm. we're in the sunlight mm -hmm. and, uh, or in some kind of, there's some kind of light that, that projects it. And, and it is, it is almost, I'm just thinking of shadow in general, it is us, it is the place where we are not casting light or where we're... I, well, I, it, yeah, no, no, I'm thinking where we aren't because actually the light we cast always has a shadow. Okay, okay. I mean, there's always something, we, we're doing something consciously. We say something with one intention Okay. And then there's a shadow with all these other potential intentions or motivations of nuances of affects. This happens in relationships all the time. One person says something and their consciousness meaning one thing and their partner takes it a totally different way. And then a fight ensues. And the partner says, well, you said so and so. And they're saying what they heard, which may not be the literal words, but maybe new undercurrents behind the words. And the person who made the statement is like, that isn't what I said, because they're holding to the literal words that they said. Everything, everything has a shadow, meaning there's always a whole unknown aspect to what we know consciously. Okay, so so there's what oh, oh okay so does that mean that when we're expressing well, like it's, it's reminding me of of something that in, in in performance that um we think we're up there i think i'm up there playing the harp um but what people are seeing is all the things i think i'm hiding like how i feel about my body or um you know an, an arm injury you know or, or or where i feel awkward because of that and so we think we're up there hiding ourselves or showing what we think we want to show. But in fact, we're loud and clear. And it reminds me, I remember I had a boyfriend, a boyfriend once and he, and he would say things and he would, in, in the way he would halt, it, would, it, it was like, you know, red arrows, like, this is important, this is important, this is important. And I remember I, I would always stop and I would say, wait a minute, what about that thing? And then one, <laughs> one day he said to me, why is it you always want to ask me the thing that I don't want to tell you? And I was like, well, because there's a big red flag that says, I don't want to tell you this thing. I don't want to tell you this thing. So of course that's what I want to hear. I'm sure, So I guess we're doing that all the time. Yeah, you were picking up his shadow. You know, there is a um, there is a psychoanalyst who is a contemporary of Jung, um, Wilhelm Reich, and Wilhelm Reich formulated a theory of character structures, and what he called body armoring. And what Reich said is, you can tell someone's basic character structure if you look at their body and you notice the patterns of muscular tension and how they hold their bodies and what different areas of their bodies do. And so that, for an example, is shadow. 
it's in the body, even if people aren't consciously aware that they're communicating that. So you've sculpted, you've sculpted yourself. Well, the, uh, yeah, the larger self and unconscious has sculpted you because it's not anything the ego does intentionally any more than when you're on stage and someone notices the um, awkwardness you're trying to cover up, your ego is identified with the covering up, but the body still feels the awkwardness. So the body shows the truth, even though the ego persona of the performer is trying to hide it. You know, the body shows the truth. The body shows the truth because what? our, our body first and foremost is the unconscious self. I mean, think about it. We aren't in charge of our bodies. We can influence it. You know, we can work with it to affect certain things, but I can't make my body digest food. I can't make my body, you know, keep the processes of my heart and breathing going, you know? I can, we can inhibit it. Like I can inhibit my d digestion by what I eat or how much I eat or how fast That's I eat. Right. But you can't control it. You can influence it. And part of the influence is you can inhibit it or you can facilitate it based on food choices. You can inhibit it or facilitate it based on the level of stress you have when you're eating. So we can influence our body, but we are not in control of our body. So it's almost like this is, duh, this is what's given to us. That's the gift. I don't know where we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's, um, um, but we can make choices about it, but the gift is the gift. And, and, and it, I mean, meaning, well, I just, what you're saying, I'm just thinking about that. It's, I'm having a strangely in body, out of body experience just at the moment of being aware that this, while this body is my body, it's kind of not. Well, it is your body, but the ego is not in charge of it. The ego actually arises from the body. And Freud said this. He said the ego begins with the body. That the first sense of self we all have as an infant child is of being in our body. You know, you only have to watch a little infant start to explore their body by, you know, oh, they wiggle their fingers so they realize they can raise a leg and wiggle toes. So our ego actually comes out of our awareness of the body. But our culture is so skewed to this idea that we can control everything. And we we have lots of influence, but ultimately we aren't in control. Again, we can think of our bodies and our psyches like the garden we tend. You know, our body is like the earth. We can do lots of things to influence the earth. We can do things that hurt the earth. Right. We can do things that destroy the earth. We can do things that help amend soil, so actually kind of amplify the earth. Our body is like that. You know, we can do things that help our body grow what we want, i.e. give us the energies to do the things that are, we desire, or we can do things that inhibit, that cause our body like the earth not to grow anything, i.e. we don't have energy, we get sluggish, we get lethargic, we, you know, become a couch potato. <laughs> <laughs> can <laughs> potatoes are good um but can we go back to what you talked about about society so i have started dating again mm -hmm. and again i never did date before so this i'm starting to date it's an adventure it's a discovery for me and and as i do all kinds of stuff comes up and one um is my relationship to how i see my body in society how i see my body as a woman and as i what and how much media still affects me like whenever i look in media i i look for where are women with bodies like mine and i never see them and 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 it may be that i, I don't know i mean and i identify that i i have big hips 
you know, this is like a, a, a thing coming in through my family. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a thing. And um, so I am always looking in the media, like, does that woman have big hips? Where's a woman with big hips? Where's a woman with big hips like mine who has, you know, who, who gets to do this or gets to do that? And so I realize that I am inhibiting myself and my sense of who I can be as a, as, as, a, as a physical being, as a romantic being, as a sexual being, it's all that, by that comparison of, of almost saying, is, is there a slot for me in the world? Is there, you know, where's my initials here? And, and, and deciding that because I don't see that slot in the media, in movies, whatever, there's no place for me. Yeah. in that in that part of life now i don't know if that has anything to do with the shadow but 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 i was really interested by what you said about so there's my ego which is getting out this got this idea i'm looking to society i'm looking to the media to the images that society gives me to try to validate myself and that seems like I'm really inhibiting something there. Well, and you are, you are articulating the shadow of the collective media, which is that certain looks, for instance, certain body shapes for women are acceptable and are admirable and others aren't, you know? And, and the shadow of that is there are a lot of us, including myself, and my body's very different than yours, but my body doesn't show up in the media either. <laughs> I'm short and look like Venus of Willendorf, you know? <laughs> I, I, I'm Rebanesque, you know? We don't have popular Rebanesque women anymore. That went out with Marilyn Monroe, I think, you know? So, you know, but the shadow then is there's this whole other group that doesn't feel acceptable or good enough or admirable or worthy of attention or so there's a big sh big shadow shadow meaning the um the unanticipated dark effect well it, as you're talking about this i remember learning just as a kid even about advertisements and the value of um, making of, of setting people up to feel not good enough in terms of selling things. Yes. And, and so it seems like that um, understanding that shadow, if I could understand it better and really understand it. And well, then I'm just thinking, but can you shine, can you shine light on the shadow? And what happens when you do? Anyway, is there a way to, anyway, let's just go on with that. But let me ask that. Is there, the, I'm, I'm aware that I'm in the middle of that consumeristic, um, uh, I'm a cog in that wheel, and I've bought my way into that cog in that wheel of, of, of feeling less than so that I will purchase products and, you know, whatever, buy more, I don't know what it is. Um, how do we, and I'm sure that that's, illuminated on all levels of our life that I wouldn't be looking for it in the media if I wasn't also looking for it in individual places in my life. Um, so is that, where does that fit in this conversation? I, I'm, I want to make sure I'm not going far afield. Well, it fits in that if you can shine the light on that, i.e. bring consciousness to realize how you have bought into this belief that you are less than because you don't look a certain way or you don't use a certain toothpaste or whatever it is, then when you have consciousness about that, something shifts in your cellular response to it. And you say, that's, that's BS. Not only is it BS, it's really distorted and evil what they're doing because it's wrong. It's hurtful to people's life. It's destructive of the life force. And you can begin then that shifts your reaction to it. And then you start to say, you know what? Look at me. I am a gorgeous woman. How many women in my age group are getting up on stage in what I get up on stage and getting a full group of, you know, thousands of people? I mean, you start to own the reality of who you are and the value and beauty of who you are. True. Uh, and I just want to say that would be, tr I, I want to get to the point where that's, that's true for anybody, regardless of if you got a thousand people in the audience or what, you know, whatever, which, um, 
which by the way, I have a show this weekend or next weekend. And, and, and of course we can only fill parts of the theater because right now we're speaking during the pandemic, which is a whole other thing, and which I'm actually really excited about because I love empty theaters, but that's another story. Um, what I'm hearing you say is something we talked about a couple weeks ago, awareness being the first step, sort of, we, we talked about awareness, mm -hmm. process, relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 so is it, is it true that the shadow, so the shadow, if it were possible to not have a shadow, would that be a positive or a negative? <laughs> well, I'm thinking about, um, the tradition of Sri, Sri Aurobindo and the mother who talk about the light that casts no shadow. I suppose if you are a highly enlightened spiritual being, you might be so pure in, um, hmm. in your consciousness that you cast no shadow. The rest of us human beings, I don't think it's possible to not cast shadow. <laughs> it's funny because there's a, there's a piece, um, it's about the phoenix. I, I'm just going to play just a, li a little, yeah. tiny, a little tiny bit of it. Um, it's it's one of the pieces that I'll be playing um, next week, and it's really. It's, it's a piece of music, but it's also a story, and it's a story about the phoenix. And it says, you know, there's a myth of a great bird, and she's called the phoenix. The phoenix flies over all the world, and there's only one phoenix. And if she should fly over you, she has a shadow of sunlight. And if she, that shadow should fall upon you, your heart and your mind and your spirit will, I can't remember, will be alive, you know, will, it will, will, will come to life. It will come to life in ways that you've never experienced before. And then, and then the, the song goes on to explain, you know, that the phoenix, um, you know, she flies for a thousand years. And when she knows that her time has come to an end, she flies to the highest peak of the, of the highest mountain. And there, in the moonlight, she bursts into flames. But the phoenix can never really die, because she lives within the spirit of humankind. And that spirit comes to the mountain, and it stirs her ashes. It stirs her ashes as the moon rises and it stirs her ashes as the stars turn. And when the very first rays of the morning sunlight light upon her ashes, once again, the phoenix flies. And then the song starts from there. Beautiful. And so it made me think about that when you started talking about a shadow of can we have a shadow of sunlight can we have a shadow of sunlight well we do i mean because it is our consciousness that has the shadow you know and let me just say that's beautiful and you know the phoenix is such a beautiful image of transformation right that we have to die to the old to be born to the new mm -hmm. So our self-image of not being good enough or pretty enough or having the right body has to die. We literally sometimes feel like we are taken down to ashes so that we can be reborn and know the beauty, in this case, of our body and right. our specific look. I mean, there is consciousness is different from awareness. Awareness is intellectual. Consciousness is the intellect joined with a different affect in the body. There's an important difference. A lot of people have awareness and what we call insight, but they don't have consciousness because they've not dealt with the feeling with it. It's an intellectual gymnasium exercise versus really being willing to go down to the ashes to Can do you it. Talk a lot more about that. 
Well, I mean, part of the shadow of our, of our self-help culture and part of the shadow of this idea we're supposed to be happy and upbeat all the time is that, that we as a society have demonized the processes of um, dying, both literally, but right now I'm talking about symbolically. I mean, the phoenix dies. She bursts into flames but she rises from the ashes. You know, if you can really tolerate feeling all the self-hate you have towards your body that's fueled by the media and bring your own compassionate presence to that, then something will shift. There will be something that bursts into flames. There will be a heat of emotion that arises and then something new will be born from that. And your connection to yourself and your body will, will change. So part of the shadow of our culture is we don't want to go through that process. <laughs> we, we, and when we start to go through the process, then someone around us gets uncomfortable and then it gets pathologized. And we're supposed to take a pill to make it go away. Or we're supposed to snap out of it. When Sometimes we, we have to just go through it as part of that shift of consciousness. It's like the phoenix dying to rise again. Right. So, so many things came into my mind while you were talking about that. And one of them was that I'm the one who has bought the media images. And I'm the one who has hidden my body so that other women like who have bodies like mine don't see themselves either. Yeah. I, I've done all that. I've bought that. I, I've, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is just thinking about just death and the, you know, the fear of death in general, mm -hmm. in everyday dying and um in the dying of the, yeah and 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 then how that relates to um just death itself which i've been thinking about since i was 12. can you talk more about um uh just talk more about oh yes consciousness you talked about awareness mm -hmm. and consciousness so we we, we were just talking awareness process relationship is that how we get to consciousness where does that, where does consciousness fit in there? And, and I don't want to get too far from the shadow as well. Well, what I would say is consciousness holds all of it. So consciousness holds awareness, process and relationship together. So it's like coordination and like, it's, it's like, it's like the gestalt or I don't know. Well, it is a gestalt of a, a sense, meaning that parts come together to create, um, you know, um, a sum that's greater than the whole. I mean, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, I believe is the way it's said. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, the, like, like there's bass, there's accompaniment, there's melody, you know, uh, right. that's the bass. And this is the accompaniment. This is the melody. But that's, and that, and that's what, and each of them are powerful and each of them are, but, but it's the effect but, but when they come together, it's the effect. Yes, yes, yes. So awareness, process, and relationship all come together. And there's a bit, there's a consciousness there. There's a consciousness, you know. So part of what I want to circle back to what you were saying about realizing that by hiding your body, you have colluded with the media images. So and, other, have become, and have become part of it. Yeah. yeah. So the shadow of your insecurity about your body is, is you've inadvertently contributed to other women feeling that. That was never your intention. You would never want to do that. That's not what you're about. But that's an example of where everything we do, we think, oh, this is all about me and what I'm doing. And it has this effect. 
That's exactly what we were talking about before. We, and I don't remember if it was on, we, we, we recorded that part, but you were talking about when you're in a, you know, so when, a, when a musician is on stage or when an artist is on stage, we think we're showing one thing, but we're actually showing all the stuff we're trying to hide. And when we're in a relationship, we, um, we think we're saying one thing, but the person is hearing all the stuff. And you said something about a window that was a... a yeah, there's, there's a model or a schema known as the Johari window, and it has basically four panes. So there's what you know about yourself and what other people know about you. And then there's what you know about yourself other people don't know about you. And then there's what other people know about you that you don't know about yourself. <laughs> and then we could go on. There's what we know about other people that they know about themselves. There's what other people know about themselves we don't know. And then there's what we know about other people they don't know. Because again, there's always that shadow piece. There's always, there's always an unknown. This is one of Jung's basic tenets of our psyche. And it's also in um, the Western mystery spiritual tradition. It's one of the basic spiritual principles. It's the principle of compensation, that everything exists with its opposite. So we have a conscious attitude, then we have an unconscious attitude, i.e. shadow, okay? And those things are always traveling buddies. When we start to know that, when we start to, to hold to that belief, then what happens is we don't get thrown off when all of a sudden something we didn't expect gets mirrored to us. Okay. Yeah, given a, will you give an example? I'll bet you have a lot of them. From yeah, well, I mean, if we think about performing, for, for instance, you know, if you're performing and you had mentioned like you're trying to hide a hurt shoulder, but then someone comes up from you from the audience afterwards and said, wow, I noticed that you, seem, you seemed a little stiff, you know, are you having some pain? You don't feel blown out of the water by it because you know there's always shadow. There's always what we don't intend to be seen being seen and part of what allows us to become more conscious is our openness to learning what's just being made known in the moment i'm sorry i'm laughing because i'm yeah. thinking when i when we were when i was kids of somebody saying your epidermis is showing <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so we we think we're going around hiding these things and we're not right we're actually exhibiting them. And, and, and it sounds like what you're saying is in order to get a sense of what we're exhibiting, we have to be aware of how other people are responding to us. Yes. If we can receive in feedback, i.e. receive how other people are responding to us, receive what other people say to us as perhaps a mirror reflecting something about us, Mm -hmm. And instead of being so quick to refute it, we can say to ourselves, hmm, I wonder where that's at in me. And then we find it and it's maybe a thumbnail's worth and it's really no big deal. Or we find it and it's a whole arm's worth and we say, wow, that's a bad energy I want to get to know. <laughs> you know, so it allows us to be, become more conscious in each moment of living. Now, something I've noticed about myself as I go on this journey in, in my life where I'm, I'm really consciously thinking about these things and how to apply them in my life is that I'll have these really icky days, like where I'm grumpy and it seems like everybody's, everything that, everything that comes in the email is negative and, you know, it just feels dark and it used to feel that way a lot. It just... And, and I've begun to notice that that seems to be a harbinger of a breakthrough. I mm -hmm. seem, and I, it often seems like, and I've equated it to like what a snake must feel like when it's shedding its skin, just irritable and icky. And, um, and, and I've been concerned. So, so little by little, as I'm starting to, I'm starting to be like, uh, oh, at first I'm like, oh crap. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That might be that thing where I seem to be, I don't know. And then I started getting worried that like, but if I don't get grumpy with it, will I still transition into this new state? It, it, like I, I, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you, you might, 
Uh -huh. But I think what you're saying, um, um, or what my fantasy is, is that your grumpy is your response to the agitation and the unsettledness that is accompanying the shedding of the old skin. Well, I was just thinking of that. I was thinking, like, is a snake gonna not shed its skin oh. just because it does, just because it's like, oh yeah, I'm shedding my skin. Oh right, it's gonna feel a little uncomfortable. Yeah, well, I guess I'll just go sitting on a rock or something. I don't know. I mean, so you know huh it's, it's not going to stop shedding its skin just because it stops being irritated about it about it that's right that's right it's going to shed the skin so you might just look at you know when your grumpiness hits taking three deep breaths and say okay something's breaking loose here right right I'm comfortable <laughs> so how can i respond to my discomfort in a more creative way or, or in a way that helps me move forward more easily than getting grumpy and kind of resisting the shedding. Right. Or I can just, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm thinking as I'm saying this, I mean, like, or I, I can just uh, ignore that I'm grumpy. I mean, like, who cares? Right, that's right. That's, that's right. right. Grumpy is living. <laughs> so long as I don't spread it around. Okay, so let's go back. Oh, so the shadow, so when we first started talking about the shadow, we're, we're talking about the part of us that is unconscious that we don't see mm -hmm. um but others but is extremely obvious to others is that true well it's not always obvious to okay. others but it sometimes is obvious to others okay so, yeah all right and um and and where where did it fit in the young i mean like well he, so he talked about it and then did he also say any therefore and therefore, you know, on your shadow's birthday, do this. Okay. Well, you know, the Jung's, Jung's primary tenet is that, and I'll quote him, by building a conscious relationship to the unconscious, we can mitigate the negative effects of the unconscious. So, so we don't know, okay, so if I don't know that I'm shedding my skin, I could think, and that I'm grumpy because I'm shedding my skin, I could think that someone's doing something to me and I could react negatively to them and create a problem that doesn't exist. Right. But if you say, huh, grumpy, what's going on in my unconscious? Okay, I'm gonna dialogue with my grumpy. I'm gonna dialogue with my agitation in my stomach. I'm going to dialogue with that feeling of anxiety or ungroundedness in my belly. Then you are beginning to build a conscious relationship to the unconscious and that mitigates the negative effects. So it always comes back to, and I know I'd say this almost every episode, it really comes back to being in relationship to everything that goes on in one's body, mind. I, I love that. I love that we keep coming back to that, almost like a refrain, like, you know, when you're doing a song and the refrain comes back, you're like, yeah, that's the part I can really sing. <laughs> I, I love that because I'm seeing that um, that comes back to the other things that I've heard about reaction versus relation. So, you know, if, if I just react without considering it, without, you know, really looking at it, then... Um, then I'm just creating chaos, basically. I'm creating chaos and disconnect rather than if I go back and I look at what, what get into relationship with myself. Yes, and you know, and I'm thinking about music and about um, the shadow sometimes of our perfectionism mm -hmm. and that the shadow of our perfectionism when we want the notes to be just right, we want our technique to be just right is that the shadow of that can be is we forget all about the musicality, which is something totally different than the technique or the right chords. That's right. Now, artists, they, they have an, they interweave in a way, but we can, we can lose the music. And so the shadow of focusing on the being perfect is we lose connection to the flow in the moment. That's really interesting. I've been I've been writing about that about how to play the music rather than the notes, uh, mm -hmm. because I'm I'm teaching a lead sheet boot camp, and um, one of the reasons that I decided to do a boot camp, meaning 
you had you go through the basic training where you learn how to do it and that but you that, but then you spend out you just were playing along it's play along learning and one of the reasons I decided to do that that way is I noticed that if I teach people how to do something they know how to do it but that doesn't mean they put it into practice and mm -hmm. they often will put it into practice with these perfectionistic tendencies and if you are constantly halting your playing and then beating yourself up, then that's what you're practicing. So if we're doing it together and I'm saying, here's where we are, come with me, let go of everything that you just did wrong and come on with me. It doesn't matter if you end up at the end of this with having played four notes, but we were together. Mm -hmm. You've played the music and let's do it again. And this time maybe you'll get more of the notes, but you're still playing the music, but let's do it again. And 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 let's do it again and again and again, because that starts to create the flow and not the stopping to get it perfect. Yes. Now, I just went off on, I feel like I just went off on, on what you said, but connect that back to the shadow so so where does the shadow fit in that? I mean, I know that what happens when we do lead sheet boot camps, so we're in a big room, there's all these harpists all around the world. They can hear me, I can't hear them, but we're all playing together. And I know a lot of them are swearing and throwing things around the room, you know, and dealing with it. But at the end, they're learning to have this fluency and, and they go with it. Um, where, where does the shadow fit in that scenario? Well, and again, the shadow is whatever is unknown for each of those harpists. I see. Whoa. So, yeah. You know, so the shadow, um, for, for me, for instance, if I were to sit down and do the, the and I actually started this week going back through your last lead sheet, uh -huh. the, um, the, pre, the prep videos, you know, for me, my shadow is not feeling good enough. And my shadow is feeling like if I don't get the right note or the right chord or the right timing, then it's not worth anything. Okay. Oh. So now I just articulated that. So it, I obviously have some conscious awareness of it, but I still get caught in where the affect, my body and mind unconsciously believes that's the truth. That's the shadow. I know that's the problem. I have awareness. I have insight. And I am far more conscious and have shifted. And, and I mean, I can now keep playing through mistakes. Yes. And I made a performance manifesto that said I was going to relate to those things that got, that got called, but previously were called mistakes, as um, creative news responses to what I was doing and listen with curiosity and that's helped me a lot you know so th there's a fine line between where we have awareness and insight that has helped us have some consciousness and shift right and shadow where there's still affect and body sensation and like an automatic central nervous system feedback loop right that creates the response in this case, quote, that I don't want. <laughs> yes, and I hear, I hear students talk about that a lot. I hear them talk about, like, I know I'm, st I know I'm beating myself up. Yeah. And then, all right, so I know we're, we're coming to the end here. Um, so how, what can I do? Like, I'm going to do this boot camp. Mm -hmm. What can I do to help the people around me? I know when they see me making mistakes, that helps them. So I get that. And, and I get that in the terms of this conversation too, that I want to be, that showing myself, showing ourselves is part of the solution and hiding ourselves is part mm -hmm. of the collective um, problem. Um, what else can I do and what could I say? Like, I love what you said about your manifesto and I love that I can help people remind themselves that this is a perfection free zone. Yeah, I think what you can also do is talk with them about monitoring what happens in their body mm -hmm. and, you know, beginning to pay attention to what, what helps, where do they feel settled in their body and that oneness with the heart, for instance, or whatever right. their instrument is and what helps them get in that state. Mm -hmm. Because one way we can counter the negative 
So for instance, when someone says, oh, I know I'm beating myself up, but they're still caught in that shame and degradation yep. from it, is they can say, okay, how am I going to support myself here? And saying, you know, that was good enough. I'm here trying. I can feel good about that I've showed up. You know what? I may not do this well on the heart, but I do bring this skill set to it that will support me. So sometimes what we have to do is if there's degradation and shame over here, right. is we have to increase our bank deposit with ourselves of affirmation and we have to support ourselves. Too often we try and counter it and we and, and we fight with it versus just saying oh there that is now where's the other side how can i build up the compassion and affirmation and self-love for myself and i do think in your teaching you can you can keep that in people's the forefront of their minds that's mm -hmm. right and as you're speaking i'm realizing that there's an awareness also here because people uh, we tend to focus so much on what we're not doing right so that we can fix it because that's mm -hmm. even dangerous that we literally lose awareness of what we can do and and that is a disservice all around it just doesn't even help our learning that's right that's right all so right see, there again we just you just articulated an example of shadow we're doing this thing can have this unanticipated effect. So, so again, for, for even as we're talking, I'm aware I may say one thing with one intention. Someone listening may think I mean something totally different. We, we have to be able to bear. That's just the reality of how things we work. But if we know it, then when someone comes to us or we recognize in ourselves or someone we're working with the shadow response, we can say, oh, wow, it seems like you took that and you're using it against yourself. And I want to circle back to say that wasn't my intention. And this is what we want to say to that part of you. So we, so, so we keep, we take perfectionism out of even that process of, of communication and realize that it's, not going to be there's no way to say something perfectly there's no way to play some there's there's and and that and that this is a process of communication and relationship that is going to be ongoing and that will deepen our understanding of ourselves and our understanding of each other yes yes and to, to circle it back to our topic of shadow and so part of what how do we get to know shadow is we're open to what shows up unbidden unexpected what we don't want the things that are prob problematic as well as the things that just show up out of nowhere to help us so we have an openness to what is just making itself known <laughs> i see so what i'm i'm just looking around my desk and i'm thinking this desk is really messy and i'm thinking that's actually something that i can learn from that's actually part of my shadow. Yeah, yeah. That, that maybe the desk represents a way that you process internally. Mm -hmm. And again, you can play with, okay, so if I organize my desk, is that going to have an effect of helping things internally? So you experiment. Yeah. Wow, Kathleen, that was really, I love that last part because it's making me think that we can watch ourselves and see what we're doing and we are actually giving ourselves cues and clues all the time yes. through that shadow self that has nothing to do with what we say we think we're doing or what we think we're showing. We That's can right. see that. We can turn a light and see what's behind that shadow, what that shadow has been hiding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, the shadow, it's interesting if we go back to literal shadow, we see the literal shadow. It's not that it, when we look, but we have to look from the right angle. <laughs> Think about it when you're outside, the next time you're outside in the sunshine, just look around and see where your shadow is. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, because you, if you're just going forward, you don't see it. Uh -huh. But if you stop and kind of turn slightly behind you or to the side, you'll see it. Unless, 
course you're walking into the sun. No, if you're walking <laughs> away from the sun. Yeah, then it might be in front of you. Right. So, you know, I think it's... it's so start um, being aware of... Where, just being aware. It sounds like you're saying start with awareness. And an openness to what is present that I don't yet know that I might have an opportunity to know. I mean, that's part of the beauty of our collaboration. We show up to see what happens. That's right. (laughs) We show up to see what is going to bubble up from both our conscious intention and our unconscious. And we're open to that process together. It's what you do when you compose music. It's what people do when they improvise at their instrument. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then it, and then it takes, it takes, if you follow it, it, it help it takes its own shape. Right. So my parting comment will be that, so the shadow includes things that both are obstacles and things that are also helpful to our flow. Shadow is not all bad or negative. There are things that bubble up from our unconscious that do block us and interfere and create the problems that we experience. But there are also things that come up that just help our life flow and help our relationships flow. And that by building a conscious relationship to all of it, that's how we mitigate the negative effects. Mm. Okay. So yes, what I'm taking away is that I can, turn to look at my shadow Mm -hmm. and that rather than seeing rather than not seeing everything I want to hide I can start to have a relationship with myself of showing myself and since my motto is don't do more hide less Mm -hmm. I realize that it that helps me to be able to do that yes Well, Kathleen, thank you again for another wonderful session. And um, thank you to everybody who listens and the beautiful comments that people send. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. And I think we're actually frozen. So I'm going to keep waving in the hopes that Kathleen will unfreeze. Uh, Okay, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) bye-bye. Bye-bye.